Hello everyone, welcome to another session for our ARD in a BARD exam. And uh, for today's topic, I've chosen on soil science and water conservation. My name is Hansa Nora and I've been your mentor for your ARD section. So today we're going to cover uh, part one of soil science and water conservation, right? And please don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon. And if you've liked the video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well as share with your friends who is giving the exam. Soil is actually a very dynamic and a diverse uh, matter with a huge three-dimensional structures which are composed of all these organic minerals, organic matter, as well as uh, these forms where the plants they grow, right? And uh, basically, this uh, soil is a material compound which are composed of five uh, ingredients. Remember this? It, it's composed of minerals. Uh, soil organic matter, living organisms, as well as your gas and water, right? And this soil is originated from a Latin word called as solum, which means floor. And if you're going to talk about these soils, it can be classified into two. Uh, basically, the definition or the formation of the soil can come out from two terms uh, such, or two studies, right? Uh, the first one being your edaphology. So this mostly deals with the various properties of the soil uh, in relation to growth, nutrition, and yield of the crops, right? And uh, these are also derived from two Greek words, namely, uh, where the edaphos, it means soil, logos, it means discourse. So, uh, so this can be uh, your another study where we study of the various pro properties of the soil in relation to its minerals. Uh, nutrition as well as the yields of the crop and there's another study uh, known as pedology where we study the origin and classification of these soils and these uh and the father of soil science and pedology is vivi dukuchev so he is the father of the soil science as well as pedology right he was a geologist who worked mostly on the soils and soil formation as well uh, and he carried out all the classification on soil taxonomy of the soil. Now we're going to go originally basic to our formation of the rocks and from where the soils are formed, right? So the first and foremost we need to understand the type of rocks from where the soils can be formed. The first one here is there are mainly three types of rocks. Right? The first one here is of sedimentary rocks, the second here is metamorphic rocks, and the third one is igneous rocks. So let us discuss in detail what each of these rocks mean and how they contribute to the formation of soil. Right. So uh, first here, uh, sedimentary rocks, as the name suggests, sediments. So it is formed from a particle of sand, pebbles, and other fragments of material. And uh, together, all these they form and accumulate to form a sediment and these sediments later on they accumulate and over time they become hard and they form these rocks. So mostly in the sedimentary rocks you'll see all types of uh, fossils, sometimes all kinds of shapes and everything in a sedimentary rock. They can be mostly found um, near the sandstone or riverbeds or any of that, right? So these, uh, as you can see here, if you can uh, check here, there are certain shapes and sizes of all these pebbles. So all these pebbles and all the sediments, they come together to form the sedimentary rock. Another example for this would be your sandstone, limestone, and your dolomite. Okay, so let's move to this metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks, these are formed under surface of the earth and these are formed due to the uh, metamorphosis or the change that occurs over time due to the heat and pressure so these are often um, uh, in metamorphic rocks one thing one uh, identifying characters that you'll see is that they'll find a layer or the ribbon like structures uh, let me just take an example uh, in any of these rocks uh, let's take out a nase rock right and here as you can see let me just um, highlighted with red. So here you can see there are ribbon like uh, layers in the rocks, right? So these are the um, identifying characteristics of this metamorphic rocks, right? And let's go to um, and some of the examples I've already given here are uh, quartz, we have a slate, we have marble, serpentinite, we have names, right? And for igneous rocks, igneous rocks, these are 
are the rocks which are formed from magma. These are nothing but a molten rock deep within the earth. This magma or the lava, they cool and they harden and in that, uh, and over time they become and form these rocks. Einstein characters is that you'll find some kind of like a bubbles or a small grains that are formed around it and these are uh, which will leave a tiny holes as well as spaces inside in between the rocks. So these are some of the identified characters of these igneous rocks. So example of an igneous rock would be your basalt and your obsidian. So these are something about the rocks and how they form come into the earth. And um, all right so let's go to our earth minerals. Right, we, we have definitely three types of earth minerals. The first one is quartz. Quartz, these are constituents of the sandy fraction of the soil and they constitute about 36% of the earth's crust. Right, and feldspar, it has the highest content in the, or the largest content in the earth's crust from ranging from about 48%, right? And these uh, these fell stars have its characteristics of this that they weather very quickly and they give rise to this clay on hydrolysis, right? And micas, the third one here, we have two types of micas. We have white micas as well as black micas. This white micas, they are more resistant to weathering than the black micas. Okay, so these are all about the earth minerals that are present in the earth's crust. Let's move on to our earth, uh, soil horizons, right? So uh, if you look at how the soil, if you look at how the soils are formed, these bedrocks are broken down into small particles and they are weathered over time and eventually they, we get what is called a soil horizon. So suppose this is a bedrock and over time, these bedrocks will wither away, form small particles and form small grains and over time, this will form into this will form into a soil and this soil is re replicated here in the form of a soil horizon and which give us a clear-cut idea about the layers of the soil ranging from O to R and how does it form. So let us discuss all of these horizons together. A soil horizon is a vertical section of the soil through all its horizon and it's extending into the present material and the individual layers are regarded as horizons. Basically, we have five types of horizon, which is O, A, E, B, C, and R. R represents a bedrock, right? Uh, the O horizon, it mostly consists of the organic matter, and it, it's mostly present in the forest area, and it'll contain a lot of, like, your dead or living materials, your uh, debris, roots, plant roots, plant twigs, and all of that combined will form your O horizon. That's in the top soil and the uppermost uh, layer of the soil. And uh, in A layer, A horizon, A horizon contains a mineral matter as well as an organic matter. So these forms, um, mineral matter will contain of all the minerals and elements is plus this organic matter, right? So and the E horizon, E horizon can be present in some soils and can be absent in some other soils as well. So E, e horizon, it is mostly formed due to the, form, uh, due to the process called alluvation. And what is elevation? Elevation is nothing but a process or a condition where uh, the soil, where the water, it leaches um, down the soil surface and it leaches out all the minerals and organic matter from that area. So in that way, as you can see here, it's clearly, uh, the, it has a lighter color if you compare it to the other layers, right? And going down to your B horizon, B horizon, because of this elevation, it leaches down on the B horizon. The process where all the uh, minerals and the organic matter, they accumulate is known as your elevation. Right? So elevation occurs in B horizon, whereas elevation, as the name suggests, it occurs in the E horizon. So a sea layer, sea layer is a particularly altered type of the parent rock. So it, it has some alteration in its parent rock, whereas in your R horizon, it is unaltered parent rock. So these are about the soil horizons of 
soil horizons and the layers of the soil. Okay, so um, we're going to go to our properties of soil. And properties of soil, the particle size and the soil texture is really important because it helps us to know what type of soil you are looking for. So uh, practically there are uh, different types of soil textures. Main, mainly we have clay, silt and sand. And the combination of these three uh, textures can form into your 12 textured classes. So let us understand what a soil texture means. Soil texture, it refers to this relative proportion of various types of soil particles, or it simply refers to the size of the soil particles, right? And as written here, we have 12 textured classes, but there are three main classes, which are sand, silt, and clay. If you check the soil texture diagram on the left-hand side, you'll see the percent clay, and here on the right hand side, you'll see percent silt and down here below, you'll see the percent sand. So to, uh, to call it a clay soil, it has to have at least 40% of clay, right? And more than 40%, uh, say from 40 to 100%, we can call it as a clay soil, right? And to call it a silt soil, again, it has to have at least 40, from 40% 40 of silt. Whereas to call it a sandy soil, it has to have at least 85% of sand. So this will differentiate between your textures of the soil. Right, so if you're going to look about it, uh, one of the most important uh, thing or the most perfect soil that we're going to get from here is a loamy soil, a plain loamy soil. So suppose uh, we're going to take from the percent clay, suppose we're going to take 40% and your 40% will come up to here or maybe here. And we're going to take suppose 50% of sand and we're going to take about 60% of your salt. So this combination makes the perfect soil as it can retain more water uh, and nutrients than the sandy soils. As well as it can, uh, it also has a better drainage properties as well as the tillage properties than this clay soils. If we're going to talk about our heavy soils, they have a more of a sticky uh, stickiness in them as well as they are more compact. Uh, if you compare it to the sandy and the loamy soils, they have more cohesion properties, and in that way they retain more water. But then the passage, the tillage, the tillage, it's, uh, and other agricultural implements cannot go past through these heavy soils. So these are mostly present in the. Uh, it's also another term for the clay soils, and uh, some uh, crops that can be that grows well under these clay soils will be your cotton, um, rice, right. And light soils, on the other hand, are most of the sandy soils. Uh, sandy soils will be more friable and they, will, uh, they do not have the uh, water retaining properties. The agricultural implements can be used easily in this type of soils. And uh, some of the crops these are, which are suitable to be grown on the light, light or sandy soils uh, would, would be groundnut, potatoes, and some legumes as well. So these are all about the textural um, classes as well as the main classes of the soil right and uh, this classification of soil particles there are two types of classification according to two um, ISSS and USDA so uh, class soil particles can be classified into five four major categories which is clay silt sand and gravel right so let us discuss all of this together. Uh, if it's less than 0 0.002, we can call it as a clay. And 0 0.002 to 0 0.2, we can call it as silt. And from 0 0.02 to 2 mm, we can call it as sand. And other, uh, from sand can be further divided into two as fine as well as coarse. If it's from 0 0.02 to 0 0.2, then it, we can call it as a fine sand. If it's 0 0.2 to 2 millimeter, you can call it as a coarse sand. And anything that is more than 0 0.2 2 millimeter is called as gravel. And on the USDA, we have the same way we categorize into four main broad categories. But here, the main difference is in the sand. So sand here in the, on the ISS system, sand is uh, subdivided into two. But in, on the USDA system, it is subdivided into five classes. Uh, which can be your very fine, fine, medium, very coarse, and coarse. So let us talk about it. 0 0.05 till 0 0.1, it's going to be your very fine, and from your fine would be 0 0.10 to 0 0.25 will come under fine, and 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 will come under medium. And 0 0.5 to 1, very coarse, 1 to 2 millimeter will be your coarse sand, and more than that is going to be your 
gravel. Uh, when we're talking about the soil structures and soil particles, another important term we're going to come across is porosity. For example, let me just uh, give you a brief example of how this different porosity will work in different types of texture classes of the soil. Say, suppose here, this is of a sand. And here, this is of a silt. And the last one is of a clay. Suppose these are the sands that we fill in a bucket or in a bottle. And these is a tap. All right, and we're going to fill it with water. The water will come out more faster in sand than in silt than in clay. Suppose if a, uh, if a sand, it'll take about hours only. Maybe in a silt, it'll take about uh, maybe days. And in clay, it can even take from months to years as well. So according to this, you can check out which one has a higher, uh, which one is more porous. So uh, here, highest porosity will be found in your sandy soils, right? So we're going to talk about the soil structure. What is a soil structure? A soil structure is defined by the way individual particles uh, of sand, silt, and clay are assembled. And this way of assembling is called as aggregates, right? And, and the naturally formed aggregates are known as pets, okay? And soil structure is mostly uh, classified and be classified on the basis of its grade, which is the degree of aggregation and the type of aggregation, which means the shape of the form or the arrangement of the pets. And lastly, we have a class, which means the size of the pets. Right, so let's go to a first one here, which is which are the grades of the soil. So it, it basically indicates the degree of distinctiveness and the, uh, and the durability of these pets. And uh, this can be further classified into four categories, which is zero or the structureless. We have weak structures, moderate structure, we have strong structure. So zero structure or structureless, there is no noticeable aggregation. So it means that it doesn't have any structure it's, itself. So it doesn't have any aggregation or the formation of these particles. So these uh, examples for this would be a loose sand, right? So since sand, if you then aggregated, it doesn't have any structure, so it'll just be a finely single grain structure. And weak structure, we have these are poorly formed, and we have indistinct formation of the pets, which are not durable and much unaggregated material. So suppose even if you check the weak structure, if you just pick it up, it's just, it's just going to break off in your hand. So that is going to be your weak structure. And moderately structured, moderately structure, these are well developed pets, which are fairly durable, and these are fairly distinct. Whereas in strong structure, we have a well-formed uh, pets, which are quite durable and very distinct. So these are the four types of the grades of the soil, right? And moving on to our types of soil structure. Types of soil structures, we have around five types of soil structures. The first one here is a plate-like structure. In a plate-like structure, the horizontal axis is longer than the vertical axis. So so these will form or this will give a vision of the plate-like structures. These are mostly found in the subsoil in the, or virgin soils. And these can be uh, further divided into a platy and laminar. So platy, the, different, the main difference between the platy and the laminar is the thickness or the units of this layer. So if it's a platy, then the units will be much more thicker than the laminar. Laminar, whereas it has thin layers. So basically these are inher inherited from a parent material. Moving on to our prism light, it's a complete opposite of plate like Here, the vertical axis is longer than the horizontal axis. So and uh, further, it is divided into two again, prismatic as well as columnar. In prismatic, as you can see here, the vertical columns, these columns or the topmost, these are mostly flattened or plate. Whereas in the columnar, these have a rounded end. So these are the differences between the prismatic and columnar. Prism-like uh, prism -like soil or the soil structure, type of soil structures are mostly found in the arid or the semi-arid region. And a blocky-like structures, blocky-like structures, these are where all the three dimensions are of the same size, but the, they have an irregular fixed uh, six shaped or dimensions or maybe that can be less equal. These are most, most these are confined towards the subsoil and again it can be divided into an angular blocky as well as subangular blocky. We have your spiral or the spear like. 
So the spirit, spirit oil can be further divided into granular and crumbly. So these rounded aggregates of the spiritual aggregates, they cannot form a, a, the site should not be more than two millimeter. It has a high organic matter and these are mostly found in the grasslands. And the wetting of the soil or addition of the water of the soil does not really affect the infiltration, the percolation or the aeration of these type of soil. So these uh, spiridal type of soil, these are the most uh, suitable for plant growth and cultivation of the crop. Okay, so let us go in detail with what is granular and what is crumbly. And this granular group of spiritual like structures, they have a lesser or they are less porous. Whereas this crumbly, they are highly porous. Right, and these are fine aggregates of soil and these are usually good for the cultivation of crops. Right, and uh, if you're going to compare between this granular and crumbly, crumbly, these are more suitable for the cultivation of the crops than the granular. And that's all about these uh, structures and here I've just given us a rough introduction about all of these. So granular, they resemble a cookie like crumbs and it's usually less than 0.5 centimeter in diameter, right? And uh, they are commonly found in the surface horizons where roots have been growing. And in blocky, blocky these are irregular that are usually 1.5 to 5 cm in diameter. In prismatic, prismatic we have in prismatic and poly, uh, pris, uh, in prism like we have prismatic as well as columnar. And prismatic, the vertical columns of the soil that might be a number of centimeters long, they are usually found in the lower horizons. Whereas in this columnar, the, the form the soil that have the salt or the cat like structure on top and these are found in soils of arid climates. Whereas in platy, the thin flat plates of the soil that are lie horizontally, they are usually formed in the compacted soil. And single grained, this is the thick one, which is when the soil is broken into individual particles, they do not stick together. So these are we'll say an example would be a sand. So always accompanies a loose consistencies and they are commonly known as the sandy soils. But these are all about these types of soil structures. And so let's move on to our uh, classes of soil structures. It is determined by the size of the pits and each primary structural type of soil is differentiated into five sizes. First one here is very fine or the very thin. We have fine or thin, medium, we have coarse or thick or very coarse or very thick. So in this way, the class or the soil can be uh, classified into five main classes on the base of its sizes. Let's talk about the soil taxonomy. And um, soil taxonomy, the father of soil taxonomy is Dr. Guy D. Smith, right? And the soil classification is grouping of the objects in some orderly and logical manner in compartments, right? So, and on the soil, we have six categories of classification in soil taxonomy. The biggest or the largest here or the broadest one is orders. We have around 12 orders. We have around 63 suborders. Great group, we have around more than 240. And subgroup, we have around more than 1,000 subgroups, right? And the fam we, have, we also have family and the series. So series, this is the most specific category and this, this forms under the lowest category of soil classification. In India, there are about more than 200 series of soil. A trick to remember the soil to 12 orders would be your Avigani house. So here I've just uh, taken out the simplified key to remember the 12 soil orders. So let's go all of these in detail. The first one here is the soil with permafrost within 2 meters of the soil surface is known as gully soils. And this gully soils, these are mostly found in a very uh, cold region or in a very cold climate, right? And these are also known as churning soils. And these are not found in India. Remember that? And these are, these can be also known as the cryosols. And moving on to a second one, the organic soils, or these are also known as histosols. They have the highest organic matter among all the soil orders, and saying about 20% of the organic matter are present here. And um, uh, it's actually uh, formed from a Greek word known as histols, which means tissue. Characteristics will be uh, they have a lower bulk density as well as they have a higher, uh, sorry, they have a lower bulk density as well as they are poorly drained. And in, uh, it is also known as a peat or a mick. And uh, a 
third one is the acid soils or the acid poor soils with a subsurface accumulation of metal humus complexes, which are known as spodosols. And the spodosols are also known as potsols. These are also found in the cool and humid regions. And uh, going on to our andesols, the soils which are formed for volcanic ash is known as andesols. Uh, so these are the most fertile, and these are found in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And moving on, we have the intensity uh, weathered soil of tropical and subtropical environment. These are also known as oxysols. And these have these are classified as laterite soils as well, where the laterite soils are formed due to oxysols. They have a high iron, aluminum oxide, other hydroxides as well. So in clay, uh, in vertisols, vertisols, these are clay soils with high strength and spell capacity. They have a specific characteristic which is known as a slick inside, right? And they have a higher clay content, right? So these, due to the high clay content, they have a high clay content called montmorillite, which uh, due to, in the, during the summer or the dry season, they have this capacity to crack the upper surface or the upper layer of the soil will crack open and the below it will have a strength and uh, swell properties which will make form the ridges along the soil. Uh, they are, these are mostly formed from a basal salts and the basal salts these are also known as the black soil or the regular soil and these are mostly found in the Deccan Plateau, right? And uh, let's go to our seventh one. We have soils of the arid environment with subsurface horizon development. It's aridy soils. So as the, as the name suggests, aridy soils, aridy soils, they belong to the arid or the desert regions. They have a lower organic material, organic content or the organic matter, and they cannot, um, they, they have a poor drainage properties and as they cannot retain water and the water efficiency is also layer. So in this way, it will increase their chances of having a higher salt in the soil as due to salination and because there are lesser leaching properties in the soil, in that way, they can have a higher, due to high evaporation as well, they will be forming a high, they will be having higher salt content in this type of soil, right? And uh, our Eighth one here is strongly leached soils with subsurface clay accumulation of less than 35% base saturation, which are known as altisols. These altisols are also known as red clay soils. Mollisols, these are present in the grassland soils with higher base saturation. These are also formed in the semi arid and arid areas, but these are mostly formed under the humid, more arid and humid regions of the area of the country, right? And we have here the tenth one is on alpha soils, which is a moderately leach soils with subsurface accumulated at more. And now we have our eleventh one, which is insectisols, soils with weakly developed subsurface horizon. So these insectisols have the highest, or these are the largest soil in the world, say uh, with about twenty percent twenty percent of it is present in the world. Right, and India is mostly, um, it's found in all regions of India except in the arid regions which will come under your uh, northwestern or western India, right? And the last one here is an antisol. They do not show any properties or uh, properties uh, properties or the profile that develop its uh, formation and they had, do not have a diagnostic uh, horizon. But these, these antisol, second most abundant, right? So these are all about the 12 orders of the soil, right? And further than that, this land or the soil, they can be classified under the land capability classification or its limitations. So it can be classified yeah. into eight main categories. Differences can be like the land suitable for cultivation as well as land unsuitable for cultivation. The classes which belong from one till four, they are suitable for cultivation and from fifth till the eighth one, they are not suitable for cultivation. So then now, let's talk all of these classification or the classes in detail. The first one is very good cultivable, which are nearly um, a deep level production land, but they do not have any limitations. So any types of all sorts of cultivation can be done in this type of classes of land. So the soils in this class here are suited for a variety of crops, which include wheat, cotton, maize, tomato, beans, any of that can be grown in this type of 
soils. So alluvial soils can be considered under this category. Right, and in the second one, these are good cultivable lands, but they have a certain limitations such as gentle slopes, and we have moderate depth and subject to occasional over land flow. They may require drainage, moderate risk of damage when cultivated. And so the use of uh, crop rotation and other water control systems can be, uh, and other proper tillage systems can be adopted in this type of uh, in this type of classes. So example for this, uh, which will come under this, would be black soil and red soils. Class number three, soils which are moderate fertility or moderate steep slopes. These are also cultivable, but they have a higher limitations, such as they have a steep slope and they have more severe erosion and severe risk of damage, but they can be used for crops, provided adequate plants cover is maintained. He or other soil crops should be grown instead of the raw crops. So some of the soils will come under this will be your shallow red soils plus your um, saline black soils, right? So these will, be, will come under your third category. Your fourth category, these are good soils on steep soils, but they are not, uh, they have subjected to severe erosion with severe risk of damage, but may be cultivated occasionally if handled with great care. And these can be, uh, they have to keep in hay or pasture, but grain crops can be cultivated or grown once in five to six years, right? So these are all about the land which can be cultivated, suitable for cultivation. Then let's go to land which can't be or which are not suitable for cultivation. So land that is too wet and stony, which make it unsuitable for cultivation of crops. These are subjective to mostly to grazing and forestry, right? And they have a slight erosion of property, properly managed, but should be used for pasture or forestry or mostly grazing. Right, and your sixth category here, there are shallow soils on steep slopes used for grazing and forestry. Again, the grazing should be regulated on the preserved uh, plant cover. If the plant cover is destroyed, then you have to use a restricted until it is re-established. So in your fourth or the seventh, in your seventh one, there are steep, rough, corroded lands with shallow soil. It also includes the droughty and swampy land, severe risk of damage, even when use of pasture for forestry, right? So strict grazing or the forest management is necessary in this type of class. And our, and our last one here is a very rough land which is not, not suitable for any woodland or grazing. So we're gonna keep it under, keep this under a reserved forest for a wildlife recreational or wasteland consideration. Right, so these are about the uh, types or the classification according to its land capability and its limitations. Uh, moving on to our soils of India. Soils of India, we have majorly, we can distinct, uh, there are usually around eight classes or eight so types of soils of India, but major classes are only five. So the first picture here is of alluvial. The second one is of a black soil. The third one is of a red soil. Fourth is of a laterite. And the last one is a desert soil. go into detail with all these soils. So alluvial soils, first and foremost is alluvial soils. These are also known as the riverine soils. So basically these soils are, they are formed by the formation of the sediments in the riverbeds near the river basins. So these are mostly brought down by the sediments, right? So that's why these are called as the riverine soils. They have a higher chemical ingredients as well. And um, the river deposits, so basically the river, they deposit a very fine particles and these particles are known as alluvian soils, right? And um, these are these are courses in the upper section and finest in delta. Remember, these have a light to dark in color. Remember the color as well. And uh, they contain about, uh, say, 45% of total area in India. They are mostly present in the indo gangetic regions of the India. And uh, other than that, we, these can be uh, classified into uh, Kadar and Abangar soils. Kadar, which, which can be also known as a newly formed alluvial soil, these are mostly a sandy. Whereas the Bangasol, these are the old alluvial soils, which will be more clay. 
right? So these are the main difference between the cutter and the bonder and the little swell. Um, these are mostly formed, these are also formed by um, insectosols. And antisols, right? And these are rich in potassium and humus, but they are poor in phosphorus and nitrogen. These are highly fertile, they're good for all crops, both karif and rubby crops. And the crops which can be grown here are rice, wheat, cotton, jute. These are widely grown in this type of areas. So the areas which come under this allegal soil would be your Punjab, Haryana, UP, Bihar, Assam. West Bengal, parts of Orissa, Delta regions of the South India. So let's go to our black soil. Our black soil, these are also known as the rubber or black cotton soil. As I've already discussed during the uh, when we were talking about vertisols and the soil order, so these are basically formed by vertisols. Right, and they also have the property known as the self-mulching or slick inside. Um, these are mostly dark grey to black in colour, they have a high clay content and they have a, content, a clay called as which is the uh, which is the factor for its uh, shrinkage and swelling of the soil. And these are mostly common in the Tekken plateaus. So these are black soil, these are mostly a fine grained dark soils. And these have a high moist retentive and they develop the crack during the summer. So it covers about 5.4 lakh square meter in India. So that will make about uh, your 16%, right? And these are highly suitable for cotton. So these are all that's why this is also known as a black cotton soil. And they are rich in iron, lime, calcium, magnesium, carbonate and aluminum. So this, this uh, soil, they are mostly found in uh, Maharashtra, in Madhya Pradesh, some parts of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu. And moving on to our lateral soil. So lateral soils, these are formed by altisols and oxisols, right? And the, uh, the silicate clay that is present here is known as the kaolinite. Remember this? And the Latin, this this is formed from a Latin word which means break and these are formed under higher temperature and rainfall with wet and dry spell. So they have the maximum leaching properties and this silica is actually leached during, during, due to a very high rainfall. Right? So the remnants of iron and aluminum oxides they are left behind which is known as latch, right? so that's from where the name comes from. So they have a color of about from brown to yellowish in color, right? And so these are uh, laterite soils that become hard when exposed to the atmosphere and they are used as building material. So these soils are mostly found in the central, south and eastern India, right? And these are mostly suitable for the cultivation of rice and plantation crops. So let's go to our red soils. Red soils, these are formed by alpha soils, right? So the red color is actually due to the high amount of um, iron in the soil. So that is the reason why it, why it imparts the color of the red. So these are rich in, uh, since it is high in iron as well as these are high in manganese as well. And um, they also have, just like the Dutch red soil, they also have this kaolinite uh, clay which helps in the phosphorus fixation. These, uh, they are formed due to the weathering of the old crystalline, crystalline rocks in the areas of low rainfall, right? So they have a more sandy and a less clay. They are rich in iron, small amount of humus, poor in phosphorus, nitrogen, and lime. So they have a slightly acidic and they do not retain a moisture. So um, they cover an area of about 3.5 lakhs, so that will make about 10%. And these are more very porous and they are friable. So these soils are mostly found in the northeastern regions of India, some parts of Tamil Nadu, some parts of Maharashtra, some parts of MP, Karnataka, as well as we have uh, Orissa and some parts of Chhattisgarh as well as Jharkhand. 
So going to our last type of soils in India, we have a desert soil, right? Um, these are the arid and the semi-arid regions. These are mostly found in the arid and semi-arid regions of Rajasthan, South Haryana, Punjab, and North Gujarat. Due to high temperature, dry climate evaporation is faster and they soil lack humus and moisture. And after taking a proper irrigation measure, the soil can be used for agriculture. We have a very negligible rainfall and due to this, a higher evaporation will take place and there will be higher chances of salination and salt formation in the soil. And which makes it very hard for any crop to be grown unless we can grow some of the uh, drought tolerant or salt tolerant crops can be either incorporated in this type, in this type of soils. Right, and these are highly pervious as well as they have a low density. So the crops which can be grown here are drought resistant crops like millets and barley. So that's all about um, the five, more five most important soils of India. Other than that, we also have a peaty or marshy soils. We have a mountain soil as well as a forest soil. So peaty soils or the marshy soil, they have a uh, they, need, they are mostly found in areas of heavy rainfall and high humidity, but the growth of vegetation is very less. A large quantity of dead organic matter, humus, which makes the soil very alkaline. And these have a heavy soil, which means they have higher clay content, which are black in color. Right? And in forest soils, the regions of higher rainfall and the humus content is less than this. The soil is acidic in the forest soils. Further, it is very important to understand the differences between soil fertility and soil productivity. Here, I've just given, I have differentiated between the soil fertility and soil productivity for the better understanding. So let us just understand what these two are. So it is the components of overall soil productivity that deals with its availability, nutrient status, and its availability to provide nutrients out of its own reserves and through external application for crop production, right? And in soil productivity, it is the soil productivity's ability of a soil to support crop production and which is determined by the entire spectrum of its physical, chemical and biology. And it is a combination, it combines several soil properties such as biological, chemical and physical and which will directly impact on the soil production. And these soil productivity, on the other hand, they depend on the soil fertility and the location. So for the soil to become productive, the soil has to be fertile and the location has to be good. It means that the environmental factors has to be good as well as the soil has to be fertile for so that this soil will be productive and it will give a better production for the crops. Right, only so for example, a soil may be very less fertile, but they may produce only little vegetation because of a lack of water on unfavorable temperatures, right? And last point here, these are used and index of available nutrients or plants. And other than that, in soil fertility, these are used to indicate the crop yield. So these are the main differences between the soil fertility and the soil productivity. Right, so let's move on to uh, our problem soils. So are basically like on the, on the problem soils of India, we have basically around four major types of problematic soils. And so we're going to go in detail, we're going to know what are the causes, what are its characters, as well as we're going to go and look about its reclamation and management of these types of soils. And um, the first one here is in saline soil. A saline soil is defined as a soil, they have a conductivity or the saturation extract greater than Electrical conductivity, or EC, is more than 4, and exchangeable sodium percentage is less than 15, and they have a pH of less than 8.5. Right, so these are the characters of a saline soil. And these saline soils, they contain a white crust of a soil, uh, which are, hence these are also called as the white alkaline. They, they are also known as the salon chalk. But these are mostly found in the arid and semi-arid regions and these are due to the salination of the uh, due to salination lesser rainfall and uh, there are in inability of this water to trans uh, to transport the soils and so that it accumulates on the upper layer of the soil and due to higher uh, evaporation as well so the water losses is high and so the soil is 
definitely accumulated in this soil. Now that uh, some soils may be your uh, fluoride as well as sulfate. Right, and the reclamation here is um, a proper leaching of the soils or just simply pouring a water over it. So the reclamation of the soil will involve basically removal of the salt from the saline soil through a process of leaching with water and proper drainage. So for proper drainage, a subsurface drainage is the most uh, efficient and more, it works well for management of the saline soil. And in addition, other than that, the addition of organic manure like FYM or compost, these also help in reducing the ill effect of salinity due to release of organic acids produced during the decomposition. Let's move on to our alkaline or sodic soils. Since alkaline or sodic soil, these are defined as soils having conductivity of the saturation extract less than 4 and we have exchangeable sodium percentage greater than 15 and the pH is between 8 to 10. And the most alkaline soils, they are particularly found in the arid regions, arid as well as the semi-arid regions, they have calcium carbonate in their profile of the soil. And when excess of soluble salt are accumulated in this soil, the sodium they frequently become the dominant cation in the soil and the solution resulting in alkaline or this sodic soils. So how are these formed? The soil, they firstly absorb, the cation, they absorb and retain the cations. They first absorb and retain the cations, cations on the surface. And these soil, they absorb the... Uh, Due to the soil colloids on the soil surface, electrical charge, due to the electrical charge at the surface of the soil, these cations are absorbed into the surface. So after this, when there is an excess soluble uh, salt, when the excess soluble salt accumulates on this surface, then this sodium ions, they become the most dominant cation, and that's how they form. They are very high in sodium, and these are the main properties of how it's formed in the soil right so the reclamation can be by due through three methods which can be deep flowing a deep flowing will actually help the hard pan which are formed by the sodium salts and this they can uh, prevent or they can allow a better aeration as well as a better movement of the water in the soil so this will help in reducing the sodiums or reducing the salt and will leach off the salts and sand filling, sand filling are also helpful as it will help in a better drainage and it, a better drainage than the clay soils which will retain more of the salts, right? So with the better drainage and uh, there will be a more better aeration as well as the water and it will improve the capillary movement of the water as well. And the direct calcium supply is like gypsum, all of these can be applied directly on the soil which will help in reclaiming the salts. Right, so let's go to our third uh, Saline, third problematic soil, which is the saline, alkaline, or the sodic soils. So these sort of soils, they have a um, saturation or electric, electrical conductivity of about 4, and they have exchangeable sodium percentage greater than 15, and they have a pH, which is about above 5, 8.5, right? And the, these are mostly formed due to the formation combination of salination as well as alkalinization. And the management of the saline alkaline salt would be the reclamation of the management for this is the same as that we will use for a sodic or a saline soil. So, so this the same thing we'll be using a deep flowing as well as we'll be using sand filling as well as we'll be applying a gypsum in the soil. So this would reclaim the soil. And a fourth one here is on acidic soils or the acid soils, the soil acidity, they refer to the presence of high concentration of or hydrogen ions in the soil and in the exchange sites. So in this acid soils, of course, uh, the pH will be less than 7. And these are mostly found in the northeastern states, in West Bengal, Orissa, Tamil Nadu, and Bihar. And in this acid soil regions, the precipitation the exceeds the evapotranspiration and hence leaching is predominant, causing the loss of bases from the soil. They are high, their leaching is highest and that way the bases are usually leached off and that way it, the soil becomes acidic. 
And when the process of weathering is so drastic, the subsoil and in many cases, the whole profile becomes acidic. So the reclamation or uh, the, the reclamation or the management practices to set the soil properly is through liming. As liming increases the atmospheric nitro nit nitrogen fixation as well as the nitrogen mineralization in acid soil through enhanced microbial activity. And uh, here I've just given some of the important crops at an optimum pH range that, that it needs for its production and cultivation. So for cereals, we have maize, sorghum, wheat, barley, they need about 6 to 7.5 pH range millets, 5 to 6.5 rice, 4 to 6 oats, 5 to 7.7 legumes, we have about 5.5 to 7, groundnuts 5.3 to 6.6, Others like sugarcane and cotton, they need about 6.0 to 7.5 and 5.0 to 6.5, right? So remember this, take a screenshot of this and um, and let's go to our physical characteristics classification of water. Uh, water, soil water can be classified into three types. The first one is gravitational water, second is capillary water and the third one is hygroscopic water. So this gravitational water, it is a free water. These are formed in a very higher amount of pores or the macro pores. And these are not available for the crop as well. And these are like gravitational water is available to plants and it drains rapidly down the water table in all except of the most compact soils. So suppose, uh, for example, these are the pores. The pores are big. And so even if the water is kept here, so since the pore size is very high, so there is the gravitational water, it leaches down easily, so the roots, they, they cannot take up the water of this gravitational water. The capillary water, these are held in the micro pores of the soil and the water and is the water that composes the soil solution. Capillary water is held in the soil because the surface tension properties of these cohesion and adhesion properties of the soil micropores are stronger than that of the force of gravity. And this capillary water is the main water that is available for the plants and is trapped in the solution right next to the roots of the plant. Right, so remember capillary water is the water which is available for the plant. Right, so the last one here is on hygroscopic water. Hygroscopic water, these are formed as a very thin film surrounding particles. So these suppose these are the pores or the particles are very fine that the water which comes under this these are very compact and very tight so that these soil or the plants or the roots they are unable to take it up from the soil right so these are since the hygroscopic water is found in the soil of particles which have a very less pore size Certain types of soil with few pores, for example, for this with your clay soil, they contain a very high percentage of this hygroscopic water. So these are the main three different, uh, different classification of the soil water. And well, that's all for today. I hope you've understood the, the uh, session properly. And if you have any doubts or if you have any queries, don't forget to comment in the comment section and I will surely uh, answer it in the next session as well. Right, so don't forget to subscribe and please press the bell icon for further notifications and uh, don't forget to hit the like button as well if you've liked this session and we'll be meeting for the next session with our part two for our soul sign.